Good morning, scholars of Earth and environmental science. We've talked about energy quite a bit this year. Energy is the ability to affect change. Humans use a variety of energy sources for transportation, manufacturing, heating and cooling, and running machines or appliances. Today, we'll talk about a few methods. I'll describe the general principle for heat and electricity generation, and then evaluate the pros and cons of different energy sources according to their effects on the environment. It might be helpful to create a chart to organize your notes. So on a sheet of paper, create an eight by three table, eight rows for each source type and three columns for the principal, pros and cons. Before we begin talking about the sources, let's talk a bit about electricity. Electricity is the transfer of energy by the movement of electrons, usually through conducting metals. Electricity is convenient because it can move a great distances very quickly, although it is difficult to store. There are, a few, there are many ways to generate it. The most common ways use a turbine, a wheel that changes the force of moving gas or liquid into rotational motion. This turbine then turns an electric generator, which moves a conducting material, like a wire, through a magnetic field. This compels the electrons to begin moving. The sources mainly differ in how they turn a turbine. Fossil fuels, biofuels, nuclear, geothermal, and concentrated solar power use heat engines to create steam, gaseous water, um, to push the turbine. Wind and hydroelectric sources turn the turbine directly using a moving fluid. Photovoltaic solar cells and hydrogen fuel cells use chemistry to generate a current of electrons instead of a turbine. Once electricity has been generated, it must be transported to where it's demanded. This is done using electrical poles spanned by aluminum or copper wires. You've likely seen them all over the place. Unfortunately, some electrical energy is lost due to heat over long distances. To make this more efficient, it is transported at high voltage. And then closer to your house, the voltage is stepped down to 220 volts so that your household circuits don't fry. Unfortunately, most of the world's energy needs are still met by fossil fuels. This term encompasses coal, oil, and natural gas, which form from the decay, or the decay of organisms from millions of years ago. Layers of deposited sediment apply heat and pressure to transform these organisms into hydrocarbons. Specifically, coal is formed from swamp plants, while oil and natural gas come from tiny marine organisms. Due to the long period of time required to form these fossil fuels, they are considered relatively fixed in their quantity, and so are non-renewable. Coal is cheap and is the dominant source of fuel for electrical generation. But why is that? Well, it's cheap and can be used right out of the ground. Crude oil is a liquid that must be pumped from the ground, then transported to a refinery by pipe or ship. There, it is converted into a variety of products, fuels, lubricants, and asphalts, for example. Natural gas is predominantly made by the gas methane, CH4. It's usually found above oil deposits, and, you, and it used to be burned off as a production waste, but now it's used for electricity and fuel. To access the chemical energy stored in those bonds, the fossil fuels must be burned. This releases tons of greenhouse gases, which contribute to climate change by trapping in the sun's rays and warming up the planet. In addition, burning fossil fuels causes a lot of air pollution. For example, sulfur dioxide is a toxic gas produced when burning coal. This can then mix with water in the air to cause acid rain. Smog produced by cars burning gasoline also chokes people who live in cities. Moreover, in burning coal, ash is left over, which is full of toxic heavy metals and radioactivity. This hazardous material must be stored. And in 2014, Duke Energy's negligent storage of coal ash resulted in thousands of tons spilling into North Carolina's Dan River, 
Water pollution isn't limited to coal. We're quite familiar with oil spills, such as the 2010 BP's Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Less dramatically, cars can also leak out oil, which can be washed into surface and groundwater. These spills contaminate our waterways, harming the wildlife that live there. Unlike fossil fuels, fuels made from organic biomass, such as plant material, manure, algae, etc., are renewable, as they can be regrown. Wood is a classic example, as we have used it for a long time to create fire for heat and cooking. A major benefit of, it, of this source is its ability to use what would otherwise be thrown away. Used cooking oils can also be reprocessed to produce liquid fuel sources like biodiesel and ethanol. Cattle and landfills also give off a lot of methane gas, so people have devised ways to capture those gases and burn them like natural gas. For biomass fuels to be renewable, they must be grown back faster than they can be depleted. An imbalance in the rates can, all, can result in deforestation, and thus habitat loss and erosion. Regardless, to use biofuels, they must still be burned, which releases greenhouse gases and air pollution, just like fossil fuels. However, this can be somewhat offset by growing new crops, which absorb the carbon dioxide to perform photosynthesis. Although there is still net production of greenhouse gases, as fossil fuels are used to refine biofuels, and nitrogen-based fertilizers inevitably end up as nitrous oxide in the air. Nitrous oxide is 300 times worse of greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, and contributes more to climate change. In addition, a lot of land must be cultivated and water used in order to grow and refine the crops to make biofuels. The crops refined into biofuels could have also been used as a food source for people to eat. Nuclear power. Very likely, you get your electricity from this source. The Sharon Harris Nuclear Power Plant, pictured in the center, provides power to many people in our area. Similar to fossil fuels and biofuels, the heat from both types of nuclear reactions is used to create steam which turns a turbine and a generator. But instead of using the chemical energy stored in the bonds between atoms, nuclear power unlocks energy stored within the nucleus of an atom, either by breaking it apart in fission or combining nuclei together in fusion. Nuclear fission uses the metal uranium, which has 92 protons and a varying amount of neutrons. Since the amount of uranium on Earth is fixed, this source is non-renewable. When a neutron hits a uranium-235 nucleus, it has the potential to split, releasing its nuclear energy as kinetic energy in the form of moving particles. Fragments of the original nucleus and several neutrons fly out very quickly. Those new neutrons can then go on to hit other uranium-235 nuclei, causing a chain reaction. The difference between a nuclear bomb and a power plant is controlling this reaction. A power plant wants to balance the rate of absorption and emission of neutrons. They do this with control rods, which are made of materials like boron, which absorb neutrons, slowing down the reaction or shutting it down completely. Fission is the main source of nuclear energy in the world. Nuclear fusion mostly occurs in the sun, although we've been able to replicate it on Earth. To review that concept, small nuclei like hydrogen combine together to form bigger ones like helium, releasing energy in the process. Since hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, fusion has the potential to be effectively renewable. However, this process only happens under extremely high temperatures in a confined area. This has been done on Earth using magnets to confine a high temperature plasma, although it is yet to produce net positive energy. However, unlike coal, which can be dug out of the ground and directly burned, uranium ore only has a small amount of uranium-235. It must be milled, converted, and enriched to increase the concentration of uranium-235. Only then can it be processed into pellets 
and assembled into bundles, then put into a reactor. Usually, a particular pellet will stay in a reactor for about four and a half years, being moved around every one and a half before it's considered spent fuel. Because the material is still hot and radioactive, it must stay in a pool to cool down for several years. Sometimes that spent fuel is then transferred into dry cask storage, where it sits on concrete lots outside the power plant indefinitely. One of the biggest criticisms of nuclear energy is, how do we store the waste? A long-term facility has yet to be set up in the United States. It's difficult to find one because it must be geologically stable for thousands of years. You wouldn't want an earthquake to break, apart, to break open all the spent fuel. So many pools have had to cram in more spent fuel, increasing the risk of an accident in the case of a pump failure. If the water were to drain out from the pool, the spent fuel assemblies could heat up and potentially melt. A potential solution to the problem of storage is reprocessing. The other major isotope in uranium is uranium-238, which has three more neutrons. It usually doesn't undergo fission when hit by a neutron. Instead, it can become plutonium, which is capable of fission. This spent fuel isn't totally depleted of energy. It can be recycled into new mixed fuel made of both plutonium and uranium. Some countries already do this but energy companies in the United States consider it too expensive to be able to still turn a profit. Regardless, reprocessing doesn't eliminate the storage problem, but it, stresses, it stretches out our existing resources. So the first benefit of nuclear power is that is the incredibly large energy density of uranium. Per gram, a fuel pellet contains over a million times more energy than coal. This could stretch even farther if reprocessing were implemented. In addition, the only thing coming out of that big cooling tower is water vapor. No carbon dioxide is released during the generation step. Nuclear plants can also be located on a small plot of land so that they use relatively little space compared to some of the renewable resources. And while you may expect that lots of radioactivity would be released by nuclear power, ironically, coal-fired power plants release a lot more, since the small amounts of uranium and other radioactive metals that make their way inside, or sorry, the small amounts of uranium and other radioactive metals inside coal can make their way out of the flume, whereas nuclear power plants contain those radioactive metals in the fuel. The last major benefit of nuclear power is their consistency. They have the highest capacity factor of any of the sources mentioned here. The wind might always be blowing, or water might not always be flowing through a dam, but a nuclear chain reaction will keep going for a year and a half straight until it's time to refuel. As mentioned before, the lack of a long-term storage arrangement is a problem for nuclear. Another major risk is the catastrophic meltdown of a reactor. There have been three major nuclear disasters, and quite a few minor ones throughout history. In 1979, there was Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, in 2013 in Fukushima, Japan, and the worst, 1986 Chernobyl. This is a controversial issue, as there is a lot of public concern about the risk, but accounting for the amount of people dying from excess radiation is a very difficult task. For example, while 30 workers died directly from the Chernobyl accident trying to contain the meltdown, estimates of excess cancer deaths range from 4,000 to 25,000. Lastly, large nuclear plants are incredibly expensive to build due to the complexity of the systems involved and construction projects can run long. Power companies often elect to build cheaper plants like natural gas, although some researchers and companies are working to build smaller modular reactors, which could lower the capital cost for nuclear. Instead of burning fuel or using nuclear chain reaction, another great source of heat lies right below our feet. The temperature underground is hot enough to produce steam, which can be pumped back up to the surface and used to turn a turbine. This is the basic principle for geothermal energy which can also be used to heat up homes. This sort of renewable, 
This source is renewable because the heat content of the earth is abundant, though the areas where a plant could be set up are limited. Although fluid drawn from the earth contains greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane and other toxic gases like hydrogen sulfide and radioactive radon gas, these can contribute to air pollution if released. Still, compared to fossil fuels, the amount of carbon dioxide released by geothermal is much lower. Injecting water into the ground also has the problem to cause earthquakes or local land subsidence. The biggest problem holding back geothermal is similar to nuclear, high construction costs. Finding a suitable spot and drilling holes is very expensive, though the source is cheap to operate once the plant is set up. Uneven solar heating of the ground causes air to flow around. We call this effect wind. This movement can be harnessed to turn a turbine. While for thousands of years this idea has been used to grind flour in windmills, recently attaching a generator to a wind turbine has been a booming renewable energy source as the wind won't stop flowing anytime soon. Wind farms, large groups of turbines, can be constructed either on land or offshore into the ocean. Wind power is cheap and quick to set up. No pollution is emitted during their operation. Wind power creates the least amount of greenhouse gases in the process of producing electricity. There's non-zero, amounts of greenhouse gases because there's always some carbon dioxide released in the construction process. For example, transporting uh, materials to the construction site. However, the wind is not always consistent. When there's no wind, no electricity can be generated. Wind speed can also vary significantly over short time intervals. So we can't satisfy all our energy needs with winds. Due to the relatively low power of an individual turbine, wind farms need a lot of land to be relatively to be productive, which can fragment the habitats of organisms that live there. Noise pollution is also a concern, as wind turbines are quite loud, which can cause stress over time. So nobody wants to live near them, and they have to be built away from existing development. Furthermore, building wind farms in rural areas means that transmission distances are long, which causes more energy to dissipate as heat. You may have heard an argument that wind farms kill a lot of birds due to running into turbines. This is a bit misleading. Fossil fuel plants kill about 30 times more birds. And even when you divide by the amount of electricity produced, fossil fuel plants are still worse. Like wind pushing a turbine directly, Water can also be harnessed to push a turbine. This can be done in one of two ways, dams or tidal power. Dams are very widely used. They are built across a river, which holds back a reservoir. By increasing the water level behind the dam, it can create a pressure gradient to drive the motion of a turbine. Essentially, dams convert the gravitational potential energy of the water into electrical energy. While tidal power also uses different water levels on either side of a dam to drive a turbine, it is powered by the tides. Although tidal power is not widely used due to the expensive cost of construction and the lack of suitable locations. Both of these forms are renewable, since water continuously cycles around the globe. No pollution is created during their operation. Dams are also versatile they can release their reservoir in order to meet demand, whereas nuclear has a very difficult time changing its power level, and wind and solar are intermittent. They only produce power when the wind or the sun are blowing or shining. Although, dams take a while to construct. They can last for a long time and produce energy very cheaply. Not many personnel need to be on the site in order to operate the plant, as a lot is automated. The dam itself is also a useful method for controlling floods and storing water for irrigation and residential use. However, dams disrupt both ecosystems and human communities. Damming up the river submerges huge areas upstream.
displacing people from their homes and disrupting habitats. For example, dams in the western United States have blocked salmon from swimming upstream to spawn. Plants decay in the flooded area and release a lot of greenhouse gases. Meanwhile, downstream, farmland is deprived of the enriching sediment carried by the river. Finally, like nuclear, dams have the potential for catastrophic failure. Dam bursts can also be extremely deadly, potentially killing thousands of people living in the area below the dam. Solar energy has a variety of applications in heating and electricity. First of all, the sun's radiant energy can be used to heat homes in one of two ways. First, passively. Clever building construction or er, clever construction builds large south-facing windows to let in lots of sunlight during the winter and release it slowly at night with thick insulation. During summer, overhangs from the roof and ventilation help to cool the building. The second heating method is active. Pumps move water into solar collectors on the roof. These allow the radiant energy of the sun to heat water, which then runs through pipes down into a hot water tank for people to use. There are two major methods produ for producing electricity from the sun's rays. The first method is less common, and you might not be familiar with it, but it relies on the same turbine generator turning principle. In concentrated solar power, a field of mirrors all point to a single tower, which receives the radiant energy from the sun and uses it to drive a heat engine, creating steam, which then drives a turbine. It can store the sun's heat for a long period of the time using molten salt. This allows the energy to be dispatchable, on demand, like hydroelectric power. Although this method can only really be used in specific locations, dry tropic regions at high altitudes. This is a bit of a problem because they require a lot of water in order to run that steam engine. The second method you may have seen on some houses in your neighborhood, photovoltaic cells. While in the past, these were expensive and inefficient, gradually their quality has improved and their price has dropped. In these cells, the radiant energy from sunlight causes a semiconductor rich in electrons to release some. The electrons move through a circuit to another semiconductor poor in electrons. This direct current can be harvested as electricity. The benefits of this are readily apparent. Solar energy is renewable because the sun won't be going away for a long time. In addition, photovoltaic cells allow electrical production to be decentralized. There's less of a need to build giant plants in the middle of nowhere when buildings can individually produce the power they need. This would minimize the losses due to transmission. Although there are many cons to using solar, the energy density of solar is quite low, so it requires a lot of space, hundreds of acres to power even a small city. Solar panels have a limited lifespan, so they either have to be disposed of or recycled. Disposing of them is a problem because they contain rare earth metals, which could be toxic if leaked into the soil. Solar cells can only produce power when the sun is out, so they are vulnerable to the covering of clouds. This means that they suffer from the same problem as wind. They are intermittent sources and can't be reliable for all the power demand. While energy absorbed during the day could be stored in batteries, these are still not that efficient. Ironically, compared to hydroelectric, wind, and nuclear, Solar has the highest life cycle carbon emission due to the carbon involved in construction and transportation. The final energy source we'll talk about today is a potential alternative to cars powered by gasoline or lithium ion batteries. We know that hydrogen and oxygen combine together to create water. This reaction releases a bit of energy. This, this sidesteps the issue of producing carbon dioxide by burning fossil fuels or biomass. A fuel cell, similar to a battery, could harness the transfer of energy in the creation of water from hydrogen and oxygen to move electrons and create electricity.
As said before, hydrogen is plentiful, so we'd have no worry about running out of fuel. However, to get the hydrogen in the fuel to begin with requires electricity. If we use fossil fuels to create the hydrogen, the fuel cells would be counterproductive. In addition, the metal platinum is needed to catalyze this reaction. The problem is that this metal is very rare and expensive, increasing the cost of hydrogen fuel cells further. So these are some interesting sources of electricity. Please also watch the pollution video, which talks a bit more in detail about the causes and effects of pollution due to some of these power sources. That's all I have for today. Have a good day.